Act anyway. So we learned that it's a chutzpah beyond logic. So the same kedusha, the way to fight Amalek has to come from a place that's deeper than logic. And that's why everything about Purim is beyond our limitations. We give tzedakah beyond limitations. The simchas beyond limitations. So one of the beautiful things that Hasidus explains is, why do we find that the way Amalek was being fought and defeated was Moshe Rabbeinu went up on a hill, sat on a rock, and what did he do? It says when he lifted his hands over his head, Amalek would lose. When he put his hands down, Amalek would win. So it says that the, what does this represent? That the hands, meaning, which we'll learn about soon in this mimer, the hands, which is chesed and gvur, the avayda of a person, has to be above the head, higher than logic. And then you could win Amalek. And when the intellect is higher than that, then you lose against Amalek. The only way to fight Amalek is through arousing within ourselves the yechida, the part of the neshama that's above and beyond and transcends logic. That's uh, one of the things I want to add. And now we'll give out this mimer. Um, you want to give this out? Thank you. So as you know, when it comes to Pesach, like every Yontif, we're going to learn Hasidus on the subject of Pesach. We have a whole week before Pesach to do that. We might start a little bit earlier. So in the meantime, I chose a mimer, which is a little bit of a short mimer but also a mimer that's very much relevant to uh, what we do practically every day, as you still see. This mime is in Hebrew, but originally it was actually written in Yiddish, which is very unusual. My mime were always written in Hebrew, not in Yiddish. Not enough. Not enough. Okay, the class is growing. But we uh, how many more copies we need? Who doesn't have a copy? One? I guess more because he just walked in. Whoa. Okay, Mrs. Yaffe, if you hear us with your Ruch HaKadosh, <laughs> we need at least another five copies. I'm is based on this pasuk. Sorry, do it to you again. Okay. So I just want to point out there's a sefer of my marim of the Frida Rebbe, which is unique. It's called Sefer Hamemarim Yiddish. It's my marim, but they're all in Yiddish. What's unique about it? The war, World War II, began in 19, a little bit before, but mainly from 1940 to 1945. In 1940, that's when the previous server came to America. What he did right in the beginning was he requested to publish with one of the first, probably, Torah magazine that had details about the war, something on the Parsha, and then in each one of these magazines, which came out once a month, there was a mimer that he wrote specifically for this magazine. And those mimer were written in Yiddish. When it's written in Yiddish, it basically means that it was designed, uh, it was written in a more simpler way, and it designed that even people that are not able to follow the Hebrew, they can also read it. So it was to make it more accessible. And the Maimarim are not very complicated Maimarim, but they're practical. And it's interesting, as soon as the war ended, he stopped publishing this magazine, stopped giving out these Maimarim, only for the five years as the war was on. And later it was translated into English, and then it was translated into Hebrew. So I do have the English translation, and hopefully we'll prepare copies tomorrow, I'll give that out. And we'll start with the Hebrew translation. So this mimer is based on a pasuk in Yechesko. That's the sheet that I gave out. And pasuk Chav Beis. This is the part of Yechesko 
that it tells us a story how Yechesko is a Navi who lived in Babel, Babylon. He was one of the first people taken away into exile. And in exile, he had a prophecy, an amazing prophecy, where he was transported to Yerushalayim. And there, a malach, an angel, showed him all the details of what the third base of English is going to look like. And not only that, but every single detail of all the measurements. So this is one of those psukim about the measurements. He's describing the measurements of the Mizbeach. It says like this, the altar was wood, three cubits high, two cubits long. Its corners and its length and its walls were all wood. And then it says, and he spoke to me and he said, This is the table that is before Hashem. The Malach. It was an angel that was his showing him all this. So we'll look into Rashi for one second. <coughs> and you can also see the translation of Rashi in the English if you want to look there. Um, more copies? Thank you very much. Yeah, the Ruch HaKadosh works. <laughs> yeah, who's, who needs more copies? Do you want to take a copy? You need? You have? Yeah. So if you look on the English where it says 22, Yenison, Targum Yenison says, standing for the altar was the table. In other words, when it says the Mizbeach is made out of wood, even though it says Mizbeach, it's really the on the table. The table is called an altar because nowadays it tones like an altar. Reason why the table is called an altar, this was the time of Golos. There was no Mizbeach, there was no Beis So to teach us that the table that we sit by at home and we eat food on our table, atones for our sins, just like the Mizbeach was an atonement in the Beis English. In fact, in the benching, right before we start benching, we say this passage, So this is the source that the table is compared to the Mizbeach. That's how the, that's how the Mimer starts. Mizbeach, H, Lish, Amiz, This Mizbeach, which really means the table, is made out of wood. The height is three Amiz. The Arka is Amiz. And the length is two Amiz. And has its corners, the curious of the walls, everything is made out of wood. And then it says, and he spoke to me, the Malach, and he said, This is the table, he's telling us who is he telling you to? The Yehudia Golos. So even though he spoke to the Jews in Golos in Babel, but in essence, it's for all the Jews in Golis and future generations like ourselves. Hashem is Baruch Alonu. Hashem is informing us. After going through Golis, which is a process we have to go through to refine ourselves because of not conducting ourselves properly when we had the base of Migdash. Hashem is Baruch Yasef Asanu. Hashem will gather us together once again. Kol B'nai Yisrael. He'll gather us. Me call Artis Agolus from all the lands of Golus. Aidei Mashiach Goyel Tzedek Laret Yisrael. And it'll be such a gathering. Mebli Lahashir Af Yehudi Echad. No Jew will be left behind. Not a man and not a woman. Nobody. And not in any country. Hashem will rebuild the Beis Hamikdash, and there'll be a third Beis Hamikdash, and that's what this prophecy is about—the third Beis Hamikdash. And as we know, that this is going to be the unique thing of this uh, Geula, that all the other times when Jews went out of Golos, it wasn't complete. In Mitzrayim, not all Jews went out of Golos after they went, after the first Beis Hamikdash was destroyed, and after the story of Purim, when they went back to Eretz Yisrael, 
Not all Jews went back to Eretz A lot of them remained in their countries. And there were other situations where there were Golas and Geula, like in Hanukkah, not everybody went out. When Mashiach comes, every man, every woman in every country, no matter where they are, and of course, even if they're not even aware who they are and what they are, they'll all be going out of Golas. And Abish will build the third base in English. So Yecheskel Navi, he had this merit that Hashem showed him the tire as Binya Beis Amigdash. He describes the Beis Amigdash, Kvish Hashem is Baruch Heralei Benavuim. Hashem showed him this prophecy. This is the famous story. Some of you know this, maybe from later. Um, before, we usually talk about this in the summertime. The Rebbe launched a campaign during the three weeks the three weeks in the summer that we mourned the destruction of the Beis English from Shiva Sabatamas until Tishabo. And during the three weeks, most people associated with the halachas that you're not allowed to make weddings, you're not allowed to take haircuts, you don't buy new clothes. How we express mourning, M O U R N I N G, mourning, Avelis. The Rebbe says that at the same time, we have to express our faith in Gul and Mashiach. And the Rebbe brings a medrash, a very, very powerful medrash that says, when Hashem showed the Beis Hamikdash to Yecheskel, he said to Hashem, what's the point? I should go back to the Jews who are suffering in Golas, tell them about the future Beis Hamikdash. They can't build it anyway right now, they're in Golas. So why should I tell them about it? It'll only make them, it'll only aggravate them more. And Hashem said, and just because they're in Golas, therefore my house should be, um, and uh, uh, should be not built. Tell them that if they learn about the measurements of the base of English, I will consider it as if they are building the base of English. This is the source that learning about the base of English and its measurements is considered as if we're actually building it. And we know that in Torah, we don't do things that have no meaning, it's just make believe and pretending that we're building it. So it must mean that when we learn about the measurements of the Beis HaMikdash, we are building it in a spiritual sense, which makes it more likely and it makes it uh, closer to becoming built in the physical way. This is a famous medrash. So Yecheskel is, is describing the Beis HaMikdash. Kashe Yecheskel metaras hechel. Then he describes the hechel. That's the part that had the three major um, um there. One was the table, one was the mezbeach, the inner mezbeach, which had the incense, and the third was the menorah. So when Yecheskel describes that location, he talks about the golden mezbeach, which is made out of wood, but on the outside it was covered with gold. And this was used for the incense. And he also talks about the shulchan, the table, which on that table, they put the lechem upon him, the chalas, the 12 chalas. Sha'elis ha'gemara, so the gemara asks the obvious question, ha'posuk maschel b'mizbeach, the posuk begins with the word mizbeach, the mizbeach is made out of wood, or misayim b'shulchan, and it concludes with the table. This is the table that's before Hashem. Are we talking about the mizbeach, or are we talking about the table? So the Gemara answers, Rabbi Yechonon, Rabbi Leza, Eimrim, Shneim, two sages, Rabbi Yechonon and Rabbi Leza both said the same thing, which is, Shebizman Beis HaMikdash, in the times of the Beis HaMikdash, HaMizbeach, which means the Karbonis, Kipro B'nei Yisrael. We know that the purpose of Karbonis was to bring atonement. So this was atonement for this Avera, that's an atonement for another Avera, for Mitzvah Zaseh, for Mitzvah Zlesesa, for harsher things, for lighter things. And the Chumash Vayikra, which we're learning right now, talks about all those details, which carbon atones for which Avera. That's during the time of the Beis HaMikdash. Ukaes, and now Begolus, he was talking to the Jews in Golos, Shulchan Eshalada Mechapar Olav. You should know that the table in your humble little house is now an atonement like the Mizbeach. So this needs to be understood. How could you even compare? Rabbi Yechon and Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yechon and Rabbi Eliezer are comparing Shulchan Shaladam, 
which what does it mean shulchan? Hakavana the orchim shomevu the shulchanan. Obviously, it doesn't just mean the table. It means something special about the table. What is special about the table? When you bring guests to your table, it's not an ordinary table. Now the table has something special. So you're comparing my table in my home to the Mizbeach in the base of English. Or with the inner Mizbeach, Sha'olov Ektirokteris, the board of Ektiris. Eich Efsha Klau, how could you even begin to compare these two things? Achilles Adam, the eating food of a person, and Achilles Mizbeach, and the food that's being consumed by the Mizbeach. And he's going to elaborate on the question. So obviously, when he brings in Achnasas, Achnas Orchim, they have guests by the table, because the Gemara says that when you have guests, that means you're welcoming the Shechina. In fact, you probably all remember from the story of Abraham that it says that welcoming guests is even greater than welcoming the Shechina, because Abraham Avinu had Hashem visiting him. And then he left Hashem in the tent and he went out to look for guests. So we see that having guests is even greater than welcoming the Shekhinah. But nevertheless, what, what is in the place of a carbon is eating the food. So I'm eating food by my table. It's like the Mizbeach eating food in the base of Megdash. How could you compare the two things? Achilles or the Achilles Gashmis. When a person eats, it's a Gashmis like a thing. I don't think I have to explain that in depth, in, in detail. You probably are familiar with, familiar with what it means when a person eats. I'm sure you heard about it. Achilles <laughs> and Mizbeach is Achilles Ruchus. When we say that the Mizbeach eats and the Mizbeach consumes, actually it says that the Mizbeach had a fire and the fire looked like a lion. It was the shape of a lion. And, and the Zoa uses the term, and the lion consumed all the food on the Mizbeach. What he meant was the fire, but the fire looked like a lion. So the fire is really Hashem's fire. The Mizbeach is Hashem's Mizbeach. And when we say that it consumes the food, it's Hashem is consuming the food. So this is, this is a spiritual process, which by the way, we know that, uh, not, not to go into it here, but we know that, um, and one of the things that many people have like, very hard to understand is the whole concept of korbanas, bringing a korban, taking an animal and shechting the animal. By the way, some people mistakenly think that Mizbeach, they actually took a live animal and put it on a fire. That's, that's not something which is done in, in Jewish practice. This was a paganistic practice. They actually put live animals and live children into a fire. But not, not by, by us, we used to slaughter the animal no different than we do it today. But instead of putting the meat into a pot, it was put on the Mizbeach. And that was a spiritual process that the Mizbeach consumed this meat. And that brought, so uh, the reason behind it, it says in the Zohar, Raza the Kurbana, Eula ad Raza the Insav. The secret behind carbon is so deep beyond our understanding. And it's something which it ascends to the highest level of insub of the infinite light of Hashem. What's really behind the bringing of a carbon? So when you have meat on the Mizbeach and it's consumed by the fire, this is one of the greatest spiritual things. In fact, let's think of it. The Beis HaMikdash was the center point of, of Jewish life. Everything revolved around the Beis HaMikdash. If you look at the 613 mitzvahs, you'll see how many mitzvahs are all about the Beis HaMikdash, the Kohanim and the Levim and so on and so forth. And in the Beis HaMikdash itself, the, the, the sort of the, 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 the Aveda, which was the most central of all, was Karbanas. That was the most, of course, there was incense. There was also the menorah. There was also the bread. But the thing that was the most activity in the Beis HaMikdash was bringing the Karbanas. So it's a spiritual thing. And yet we're comparing that to an ordinary person sitting by an ordinary table, eating ordinary food. And not only that we're comparing the two, but you say to him, it's more than that. 
We're comparing it in terms of it, what it accomplishes, that in terms of atonement and forgiveness, we're saying that it's the same thing. Just like the Mizbeach brought atonement in the time that the Beis English was standing, Kargam Ata Begolus, so to now in Golus, Hashulchan Makap and Machaper. The table accomplish the same thing. How could you compare that our table should accomplish the same thing the Beis English accomplished and the Shulchan accomplished in the, I mean, the Mizbeach accomplished in the times of the Beis English Rayakayim? And that's what they say, that the table is a atonement for the person. So now he's going into a few of the details of the way they express themselves, the wording. What do they say the table is something which brings atonement? They don't say the expression sudosay. They should say the suuda, the meal is a atonement. Or achilosay, the eating is atonement. It's not just the table, it's what you do on the table. That's what it's all about. So the fact that they chose to phrase it this way, the table is, indicates something specific about the table, about the way it brings atonement. Let's turn the page. They should have said one of the other ways, either Suda, the male, or Achila. In both cases, it's referring to just like the Mizbeach consumed the carbon. It's the carbon that brings the kapara, right? The Mizbeach is the carbon. So the carbon would be equivalent to the food on the table. So either we can talk about the food or we can talk about the act of eating the food. But why shulchan? Certainly there's a hidden uh, intention in choosing precisely those words. And then he goes into something, it's, it's as if by the way, but he goes into understanding the language of Torah. That the words in the Torah, the language in the Torah, is everything is very precise. Every word of our sages, Yeshurebez, Lurayan, Omuk, Vavon, Elokis. Yes, it's alluding to a thought that's very deep and something godly. Shizel Primi Satera. That's what Primi Satera Chasidis is all about. Is the Neshama shall call Sugi Vachal Allah Bechlal. Is the soul behind every subject and in fact every halacha, which means Hashem Shekol Guf, just like every physical body of every human being, or the same the body of an animal. It's a lie because of the neshama. As we know, this is one of the differences between a person who believes in Hashem and in Torah, or a person who has a shalom doesn't. So everything is explained purely scientifically, biologically. The body does this and the body does that. But according to Torah, the body has no life in its own right. The life of the body comes from the neshama. That's its source of life. And really, where is this written? In the Chumash. And right in the beginning, Hashem made the body of Adam Arishan. And then it says, and he blew life into him. And that's the neshama. And this is the source of its life. So just like every single body has a neshama that gives it life, kach yesh gam guf v'neshama. The Torah also has a guf and a neshama. There's the body of the Torah and the neshama in the Torah. Hagal yesh the revealed part of Torah, shua guf shol Torah, that's the body of the Torah, which means the halacha. The halacha is that you eat matzah and pesach how big the matzah has to be, how much time should it take you to eat, when is the matzah kosher, when is there a question of the kashas of the matzah, and how does, what's supposed to be the ingredients of the matzah, how many minutes is it supposed to be in the oven, not more than 18 minutes, and from when you started mixing it with the water, all these details, that's called the body of Torah, technical details of how to observe the mitzvahs. 
Balyasha Batera is the body. Makabel is chayis, but it gets chayis, mepnimis hatera, this whole new realm of life that it, it, it gets when you read the deeper meaning of Torah, that's the nesham of Torah. In fact, we just had an example that we learned in class with Purim. The body of the Gemara that we learned was at Rabbi and Rabbi Zera with two sages, and they went to drink uh, wine on Purim, and they drank a lot of wine. They drank so much wine until they became intoxicated, and they became so intoxicated that Rabbi took a knife and he shafted Rabbi Zera. That's the story. That's the body of the story. Now we have to explain why did he do it and why wasn't he punished and why didn't he do tshuva? A lot of explanation, but that's the body of the story. And then what's the nisham of the story was that they drank wine, but we learned in the sicha, I won't go into it in the details, drank wine, and by doing that, it opened up the hidden chambers of their nisham, of their mind, of their heart. They were exposed to the hidden chambers of godliness, which normally is not accessible. And they began to experience the very, very high level of godliness. And as a result of that, Rab, Rab Zera, his neshama expired. It was so overwhelming that it couldn't be contained in his body anymore. It's a whole different meaning. That's the neshama of the story. And the story, the way we read it literally, is the body of the story. That's the way it is in every halacha. Every halacha has a body, has a neshama to it. The frat ba agodas, especially the stories, like this with Rabbah is called agodah. You shouldn't confuse with the word hagodah, that's spelled with a hey. Agodah is spelled with an aluf. Hagodah is the hagodah which you read on Pesach. Yes, the root of the word is the same, it means to relate. Agodah means the stories that are found in Gemara. So when you hear something which is not a halacha, but more of a story, what's the story behind the story when the sea split? And what's the story behind the story of Purim? Like you had classes on Megillah Sester and you hear all the stories and you just hear it's from a medrash. So just to know the information, there are two kinds of sparring that gives up stories behind the story. One is called medrash. And these are basically separate books. It's called Medrash. One is called Medrash Raba. Then it's Tarek Veli Yahu. There's Medrash Tanchuma. There's a lot of Medrashim. Then there's another place, another source, which is in the Gemara, there are stories that are the stories behind the story of Mitzrayim and Purim and so on. For example, there's a Gemara called Masekta Megillah. And in that Gemara, you have a lot of the stories about what happened Purim time. And on top of that, there's much more in the other books, which are called Medrash. So there's a story in Gemara that's called Agada, with an Aleph. So the Agadas, the stories are even more, uh, the hidden secrets of Torah are there. It doesn't bring it here. Yeah, it does bring it here, next few lines. The Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, that most of the secrets of Torah are hidden in the Agada. In other words, the stories you read in, in Gemara are sometimes so weird, so, uh, so unexplainable, that the only thing you can say to yourself is there's got to be something much deeper here, like this story. I would feel very bad if there'd be someone who read the story that Rabbi Shech to Rabzeira, and it's just fine, that's, that, that's no problem. Yeah, Shech Rabzeira, get drunk. And he shall, that means he has no concept of who Rabbi was and who Rabzeira was, and what Yiddish guy is, and what great tzaddikim are all about. And if you do have a concept, it's impossible to, to, to learn the Gemara without your head splitting open. I don't know, it doesn't make any sense. And even if you don't know the answer, but you do know there must be something deeper hidden here. So there are a lot of stories in Gemara that are very strange about what Hashem is doing. Do you know that Hashem plays with Leviathan every day? That's playtime. There's a, Gemara that, there's a Gemara that gives us the Abish schedule. What does he do on a daily basis? This hour, the next hour. One hour, I think it's an hour that he spends playing with Rubiosa. 
But it's Hashem, so don't, don't get scared. He doesn't play with a little fish. He plays with Rabiosan because he's Hashem, so he plays with a huge fish. How can you learn that Gemara and not, and not even realize there's got to be something very deep here? By the way, this Parsha Shmini is a mimer from the Alter Rebbe, and the Kutitera that actually starts with that. There's a Pasuk and Tillam. This Leviosan, Yatsarta, you created Lesachim, but to play with it. Hashem made it to have fun. That's his entertainment. <laughs> so obviously, how the Rebbe explains what it means, Baruchni is. So the Agadas, the stories in Gemara, they are clearly have a deeper meaning to it. <laughs> Even the simple Pshat is a Rem, as it's alluding to something. The simple Pshat. Even, even without chesed, it's just on the simple level, you must say that it's alluding to something more. It can't be just simple the way it appears. God is chazal, and what is it alluding to? Rosin the rice of the hidden secrets of Torah. When the friend Rebbe would say Rebbe, Stam, he usually referred to the Alter Rebbe. As the Alter Rebbe says in the Geris HaKadosh, Simen Chav Gimel, in the Agada, Gnuzin, Rav, Sedis, Hatera. Most of the secrets of Tera are hidden in the Gemara, specifically in the Agada part. When you learn the Agada in Ein Yaakov, the Minyan Asara, and you learn it together as a group of ten, Halim would learning that itself, Mechap Ravanesim Shalada. That itself is an atonement. There's a Sefer called Ein Yaakov. Obviously, it was written by someone whose name was Yaakov. What he did was he collected all the stories from Gemara and made a separate book out of it, which means if you want, you can just read the stories alone. They come from Gemara, but it's in a separate book. And now we have it translated in English. So it used to be customary and probably still is in many communities that when people went to work, came home, came to Shul, to Dav Mincha and Mayrev, at the end of the day, you're exhausted. And you're so exhausted, especially the simpler people, it was very hard to concentrate on learning something deep. So the Rav and the Shul would usually teach things from Ein Yaakov, which was stories. And of course, when he told the story, he would also give an explanation, what does it teach? A lot of it are stories that teach us character traits, a lot of the stories that have deeper meaning like this story, and that's called Ein Yaakov. And that alone, learning in Yaakov, it says, brings uh, atonement to a person. So here we have to understand that when Chazal choose a certain language and certain words, the precise words are chosen because in addition to the simple meaning, there's something deeper. And that's why they choose a different word. In that word, you can find and see there's a deeper meaning here. So the same is by us. When the Gemara says, it says if somebody uh, spends a lot of time by his table, Mayrech comes from the word Aruch, long. He's spending a long time by the table. That brings atonement. The Gemara doesn't say he spends a long time with the meal, with his eating. Same thing again. A person spends a lot of time by the table. Basically, they spend time with the meal. The meal is extended. They're eating longer. So either it should have said someone who spends a long time with a male, or it should have said someone spends a long time eating. It must be a specific, precise a wording that's teaching us something that it says, So just like by us, it says the table is an atonement. Over there, it also says someone who spends a long time by the table, something about the table. So the Indian behind this is Bachilas Mizbeya Kurbanas, Achila Atzma, Gamhi Ika, Kol Khilav Lavaya. By the Mizbeyach, when the Mizbeyach, we put the food, the meat on the Mizbeyach, and we know that some parts of the meat went out of the Mizbeyach, some parts of the meat were eaten by the person who brought the carbon or the Kohanim. But it says the chaylev, which is the fat of the sacrifice, that is always on the mizbeach. The words in the chumash is kol chaylev lavai. The fat goes to Hashem. 
according to Achlis, Mahashumon Vameshubov. So the word fats means that it's the sort of the, the best part. Like we, we use that term in our own language, in English and other languages, when we say the, the cream of the crop, meaning to say the best. So the best part has to go on the Mizbeach. We just had this recently that the Rambam writes that when a person has to give something to Hashem, in other words, I'm using something in my house for mitzvah purposes, I should always give the best. And we learned this from the story right in the beginning of the Chumash, which is Cain and Hevel. That Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. Hevel's was because Cain brought the leftovers and Hevel brought the best. He said, I'm bringing a carpet to Hashem. I have to bring the best. And Cain said, anyway, this is going to get burnt. So what's the point? I might as well bring unimportant pieces. So called Chalim, the best that goes to Hashem. A carbon to Achilles, my Shumla Meshubov. So by Chilis, so the Maikru, I reach as a Shulchan. So it looks like by when a person sits down by his table to eat, it also has to be similar to that. And what does it mean that the table is long? Ikra Achilis, or Achilles, had to Ellis Shema Echo. That when a person eats, the main focus, the main purpose of eating should be the benefit from the eating, but not just the, <coughs> the pleasure in eating the food should not be sort of the end in itself. By some people, eating the food is an end in itself, eating food for pleasure. The real purpose should be not just the pleasure of the food, but that this food brings a certain benefit to the body, makes a person healthy. Lahavri gufa to make the body healthy. <laughs> As our sages say, Kahi Darka Shotera, this is the way of Torah study. Pazma Malach Techal, eat bread that's dipped into salt, etc. In other words, if you want to be able to, to uh, study Torah properly, you need to eat. So I'm eating in order to be strong, and I want to be strong in order to study Torah and do mitzvahs. So the Torah teaches us part of the Torah teaching is not just to teach us what's permissible to be eaten or what's not permissible. That would mean like saying these foods are healthy and these foods are not healthy. So the Torah tells us these foods are healthy spiritually and these foods are not healthy spiritually. So the Torah goes beyond that. The Torah teaches how a yid should be eating. That the yid should be eating in a refined way. Not just to eat healthy and not healthy, but to eat in a refined way. A yid is a, a child of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. A yid is a servant of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And therefore, as a child and a servant of Hashem, who is the king of all kings and the creator of the universe, my eating should be in a much more refined way. And, and that's where it's going to explain what's the shulchan of Nei Hashem and how the table brings atonement. Okay, we'll stop here.